look into the Word of God, but really we find that we're also letting the Word of God take a deeper look inside of us. Just as a mirror gives an image of ourselves, the Bible mirrors truth to us. It's like a backstop that collects truth and reflects it right back to us. The Bible, God's Word, becomes a mirror that really, for you and me, to see reality. Um, I, I want to ask you something. In fact, I would like for you to ask yourselves a couple of questions. I hope you will really do this and think deeply about it. How do you value yourself? And then also, not only that, but how does God value you? You know, most of us, um, we act like we've got it all together, but we really struggle when it comes to identity. Most people struggle with feeling like they measure up or if they are good enough. But a lot of people see themselves as a pawn, but when God looks at you, He sees a king or a queen. So, how do you think God values you? What does God say about you? I want to suggest that God dreams of you reaching your full potential. He longs for that. He dreams for that. He hopes for that. If you're a Christ follower, God says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God sees a king or a queen. Here's what the Bible says. Now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God. Heirs with Christ. Like I mentioned last week, that Greek term heirs, it literally means those who derive their allotted possession by sonship. It's an amazing concept that we get to be heirs with Christ. We are the sons and daughters of God. Let that wash over you. That's such an amazing thing. And so I challenge you to begin to behave like what God has called you. This Easter sermon today is called Out of the Shadows. Out of the Shadows. First, just a brief review. Sort of a previously on Vesset so that we can all be on the same page. Here's, here's what it says. Um, you know, in fact, whether you were here last week or not, um, because this campaign has lasted five years, five weeks, but, but the background that leads us to this standalone sermon right now is this. Week one was the man in the mirror. Uh, we were in James chapter one, and uh, we were talking about three different things that James says. He says, be quick to listen, be slow to speak, when we look at that man in the mirror, we need to take a careful look. He says, always be looking into the perfect law that gives liberty. That's, that's God's Word. And so, we're looking at the man in the mirror. James says it this way, someone who looks at his face in a mirror, but then he forgets what he looks like. Have you ever done that? I have. This morning... I want all of us to remember. Remember who we are. Remember whose we are. Remember our bearing and our underpinning. And what we learned is that we have to keep looking into that perfect law that gives liberty. But quick to listen, slow to speak. That's the man in the mirror. Eyes that are trained continually upon the Word of God. 
And uh, then week two was called the mission in the mirror. You may remember um, I had what I called a consultant. He came and helped us. Uh, his name is Bruce Headley. He's a friend of mine. And Bruce did a remarkable job helping us look at the mission in the mirror. And the reason we have the globe is for us, the way we interpret the mission is that we've got to get this good news to all parts of the world as quickly as possible. Um, that's the mission. Listen to this. It's not fair that we get to hear the gospel message many times when some people have never even heard it once. And so, from the very beginning of the Assemblies of God, our church has always been about getting the good news to all parts of the world. That is priority number one. And so, uh, we want to share the good news a, a, across the sea, but also across the street. We want to share the good news around the globe, but also around the corner. Everybody deserves to hear this good news. Now, week three, we said it this way. The message was titled, uh, Sometimes the Mirror Dims. And in that lesson, we were looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and, and it's verse number 12. And actually, um, that was also, you remember, St. Patrick's Day? So, 1 Corinthians 13, it, it says, Now we see in a mirror dimly. And so I've had this, this visual in my mind all through the weeks of, of just a, a dim look at the mirror. I mean, you can kind of still see it, but it's, it's darkened. It's not quite as clear as it used to be. And, and all that week we talked about how St. Patrick in actuality he faced a lot of troubles. He was a, a slave for six years in Ireland and then went back to his homeland of England where he eventually felt the call of God on his life to go back to Ireland. Isn't that amazing? To be a missionary. And most of his life he was misunderstood and ridiculed. He was not a hero until hundreds of years after, after his death. Sometimes you look in the mirror and uh, it's, it's dim. And life is a backstop. It mirrors that character right back to you. And so, this month, we've been really looking deep. Last week was week four, and it was Palm Sunday. And uh, we celebrated Palm Sunday here uh, by, by learning that the old palm tree gets its name because the palm looks like a hand. Palma is the Latin word hand. And so you can kind of see the palm in the, in the tree. And so what we decided was last week that the very best thing we could do is to put our palm into the palm of the Lord Jesus, hand in hand. And you may have heard the saying, he's got the whole world in his hand. That's... that's that's the picture. That's, we've been looking in the mirror all week, all month long. Um, now, with that, with that little backdrop, now, let's read the Easter story together. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 8. It reads like this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down and with their faces 
to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Aren't you glad about that? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how He told you while He was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered His words. I'm going to share with you three observations this morning. Here's the first one. Number one, they found something they didn't expect to find. And they didn't find something they did expect to find. They, they find something that they didn't expect. The stones rolled away. I mean, they were amazed by this. It would have taken, they say, four grown men, possibly more, to be able to push that stone out of the way. They went without a plan. They didn't even really know how are we going to get in the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. But when they get there, the stone has been rolled away. They found something they didn't expect. But they also did not find something that they did expect to find, and that is they expected to find the body of the Lord Jesus in the tomb. And he's gone. The tomb is empty. My hope is that you're, if you are with us as a guest today, especially, my hope is that you find something this morning that you didn't expect to find. Perhaps you came because somebody invited you, or maybe you thought, you know, um, I got this invitation that was handed to me. Maybe I'll go and check it out. Or so, may possibly, you've driven by on the street and you've wondered, what's it like in that building? I wonder what they do inside there. I wonder what that church is like. Are they, are they okay? Can I trust them? Are they strange? Yeah, a little. <laughs> are they normal? Uh, not so much. Not so much, but... But I hope that you found something you didn't expect this morning. I hope as Pastor TJ, man, he opened this service with, that was dynamite. He was just on fire. I hope you just thought, wow, this is, this is neat. I hope the songs ministered to your spirit. I hope that you, you found something in them and you went, wow, this is kind of nice. I hope you met somebody new and you thought they're actually not that bad <laughs> they are a little strange but but in a good kind of a way they're they're sort of like me and so I hope that you enjoy being here more than anything I hope you experience Almighty God showing you that he loves you Amen. so much he loves you and He wants you in relationship with Him. We must come out of the shadows and into the light. Imagine the scene at the tomb that first Easter morning. It's early in the morning and Matthew in his version, he says, that it was still dark. They're making their way carefully through the dark. And you know what that's like. If you've ever walked in the dark and you, you're looking out there and you see things, you think, well, that kind of looks like a person, but maybe that, is that a tree? I think that's a rock over there. Is this the dirt path or where am I headed? And, and you know what it's like in, in the early morning? There, there's sort of a, a frigid, sort of a a mist in the air as you're moving along. But it says that suddenly the darkness of the pre-dawn fog is illuminated with dazzling, brilliant light as they encountered two of God's messengers who are sharing the good news with them. These are holy angels 
It said they suddenly appeared. It says they gleamed like lightning. Plato was a famous philosopher. He lived in Athens, Greece in the 5th century BC. He wrote his most famous work. It was called The Republic. And in it, he asks his readers to imagine a cave, a dark cave. It's, it's a cave where people have lived their whole life. In the cave. They don't have any source of light. They're far away from the entrance. They don't even know there is an entrance to the cave. They just exist in one small corner of the, of the cave. And in that cave, the only thing they have is they've got a fire in one end of the cave. And they see it burning. And they feel the crisp heat. And they can see the people standing in front of them. And the fire creates shadows on the wall of the cave all around them. And all they can do is live in the cave and reach for the fire. And all, all they can see are the shadows. They live in the shadows. They've never really come out of the shadows. They don't know what it's like outside the cave. You know, I think people are tired of living in the shadows of the cave. I'm so thankful for the day that Jesus brought me out of the shadows and out of the cave. <laughs> In America, we need Jesus more than ever before, don't we? Did you know a recent Wall Street Journal poll showed that the things we used to value in America are at an all-time low? Um, just consider this. Patriotism, religion, the idea of having children... <coughs> From 1998 to 2023, over those 25 years, those three things have plummeted at an all-time low. The only thing that has increased is people saying money is very important to them. We're at an all-time low. We need more medication for heart disease, nerve disorders, depression, anxiety than any time in recorded history. Patriotism, religion, having children, all time lows. Valuing money higher than it's ever been. These are our priorities and it has left us with such pessimism and cynicism in everything and about everything these days. I heard an individual this last week that I thought was on a conservative talk show. I was amazed at his take as he was asked about Easter and how will you celebrate Easter. And, and he said, oh, come on, man. You know, let's get real. He said, you know, at Christmas time we got Santa Claus and then you've got some baby that was supposed to be born a king. Come on, man. And then Easter, we got all these Easter eggs and some guy that rose from the dead. Come on, we got to get real. We got to admit that it's fake. Now, that's not an exact quote, but I guarantee you that was the sentiment that came through loud and clear. Um, he can say, and anyone can say, whatever they want about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, but no one should ever risk speaking a sarcastic word against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That is dangerous business. Anyone who blasphemes the Lord is a breath away from eternity and a razor's edge away from judgment. Now, admittedly, we do like to have fun. 
Um, Christmas time we have a Santa Claus and the kids get to sit on his lap and it's just good, clean, wholesome fun. I wish you could have seen our, our Easter bunny yesterday. Man, it was awesome. He was just brilliant, had on his beautiful, you know, white costume and the red, the blue vest and a big old bow tie and he's giving out candy to all the kids. The kids just love the Easter bunny and uh, lots of families were getting pictures with the Easter bunny. It was just awesome. It was an awesome day. Um, I, I don't want to ruin your view of him, but listen, even the Easter Bunny will let you down. <laughs> this last week, I'm, I'm about to show you some pictures. This, these Japanese photographers, their names were Takayuki and Mora Nakamura, <laughs> they captured these high def super slow-mo close-ups of a bunny brawl. And here it is, look at this. Okay, yeah, nice power drive to the face. <laughs> look at this, I love this next one. Hi-ya! Can you say jujitsu cool? I mean, man, this is slow-mo. Look at these bunnies, these are Easter bunnies, by the way. Look at, fly, I can fly. You fly through the air. <laughs> oh no. Where am I going to land? <laughs> Where is this going to end? Oh my goodness. Easter bunnies are fun, but Easter bunny won't bring you resurrection. Easter bunny won't bring you eternal life. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, who conquered death, hell, and the grave, He lives forever because He lives, we live so now, four weeks ago, when we started this, uh, this journey, some of you might remember we started in James chapter 1. And I want to go back there, where we began, and consider the words that were written immediately before those words that we read that first week. I'm looking at James chapter 1, verse 16. Don't be deceived my dear brothers and sisters, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. The Father of the heavenly lights. Who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all He created. You may be familiar with verse number 17. It's worded in a popular translation. There is no shadow of turning with thee. A shadow of turning. Who does not change like the shifting shadows. And we won't read on to it, but then, of course, the very next verse is the first verse of this whole series. Um, we must be slow, quick to listen, slow to speak, look into the perfect law of liberty, looking into that mirror that reflects God's truth to us, God's holy word. And you know, even, even with this text, I'm still picturing what it must have been like for the women approaching Jesus' tomb in the early morning hours. Trying to make the outline of things. Is that a rock over there? Is that a tree? Is that a person coming towards us? The dazzling light shines. Everything suddenly is clear. And based on James chapter 1, it brings us to our second point, which is this. The true source of light doesn't shift and is never eclipsed. Something miraculous happened in that tomb that day when those angels appeared. A brilliant, dazzling light. The true source of light doesn't shift. It's never eclipsed. We're talking about light at its very source. Father of lights. Overseer of all that is light. Think of this, it is a light more powerful than the sun, moon, and stars in all of their brilliance. Each of them moves and rotates and at different times is eclipsed. 
But there is a light that is the source of all light. It is never eclipsed by anything. Theologians and Bible scholars throughout the centuries have understood James 1.17 to be speaking of the immutability of God. Immutable. Perfectly strong. Self-sustaining. Incapable of error. Almighty God. From the instance of creation, God spoke, Let there be light. Have you considered this? There is in some sense, some mysterious sense, there is light eternal that happened from the moment of God's first creative word. And that light precedes the sun, moon, and stars that were not created until day four. Think about that. Powerful, everlasting light from the instance of creation. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. When Jesus spoke again, he said to the people, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so the last, the third observation, the last one, come out of the cave. Come out of the cave. I love Easter. It's my favorite holiday. I mean that. I love Christmas, but I love Easter more than I love Christmas. I love the birth of Jesus, but I love the resurrection of Jesus. And I love the fact that on Easter, that's when all the church comes together. I just love that we, there's so few times that we can all come together and just be worshipers in His house together. It's a beautiful, amazing time. If you think about the the, the run of the mill and the calendar and all of the events, it's very rare throughout the course of the year that God's people can all come together. But on Easter, we love to all come together in worship. But here's what I would say. Whether you're walking currently with Jesus or if you're just a casual observer, and hear me on this, you might be coming to this building Sunday after Sunday. You, you might be hanging around with church people, but maybe you still are bound in a cave and you haven't truly given your heart to Jesus. Today is your day to come out of the cave. Some of you, it might be that you just really have not considered it, but even coming here today, you, you found something that you didn't expect. God encountered you and you realized wow, some of the, the problems that I'm facing in my life, some of these challenges that just, they come over and over and over again. I do feel like I'm in darkness. I do want to see more clearly. I want to come out of the cave and receive Jesus. Well, there's one last scripture I want us to look at. I'm reading it from the Message Bible which is, I would classify the message as a beautiful, a beautiful paraphrase of Scripture. I, um, I go back and forth on that because I know the story. Eugene Peterson is a wonderful, respected scholar who went into seclusion into the mountain cabin, and if I remember correctly, it was three years of just being alone with God working through the scriptural text and rendering what we now know as the Message Bible. It's beautiful. Some people say, well, it's not really a, a translation. In fact, some people say, I don't even know where he got that. That's not in the text. But, it, but he's using a, a dynamic approach to interpret and bring it into current times. He said it was a translation. Before he died, he said, it's my best effort at a translation. 
But most people say, well, it's just a, a really good paraphrase of the Bible. Because I think usually for a translation, you want a committee, you want a, a school of people. Most have 70 or so scholars contributing. But, but this is such a beautiful text. And, and I'm going to read it without commenting. These verses from Colossians chapter 1, I hope I can capture the way that I know Eugene Peterson was trying to express the beauty in Colossians chapter 1. God rescued us from dead-end alleys and dark dungeons. He sets us up in the kingdom of the Son He loves so much. The Son who got us out of the pit we were in. Got rid of the sins we were doomed to keep repeating. This next section falls under the heading, Christ holds it all together. We look at this Son and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this Son and see God's original purpose in everything created. Now just for a moment, I have to side comment Colossians 1.15 in the NIV is worded this way. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all, over all creation. So Eugene Peterson, NIV, side by side, that same verse, here's what it means. It means He is the exact radiance of the Heavenly Father, the exact representation of His character and likeness. The word firstborn is a very unique, rare Greek word, prototokos, and it sort of means prototype. Uh, there's no other. It, it doesn't have to be, it, it doesn't have to do with him being born in the sense that he was the first one born, so maybe there's another son. It's not that at all. It's a Hebraic concept. Instead, it means that he is honored with the rights and privileges and responsibilities attached to the Jewish idea of the firstborn. In other words, he's the head of the family. And reading on for everything, absolutely everything above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in Him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, He organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade. Oh, I love that. He was leading the resurrection parade. He is, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, He's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is He. So expansive that everything of God finds its proper place in Him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe. All the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe. People and things Animals and atoms get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies all because of His death, His blood that poured from the cross. I don't know if any of you noticed this. I'm going to grab something real quick. I'll be right back. But if you were paying attention during the opening, you probably noticed... Um, that the mirrors that I've been using, um, I had two gold ones and one black one. Did any of you notice that? Like, I wonder why that one is black. Or did, yeah. yeah, some of you noticed. Some of you didn't notice. It. Some of you are like, there's mirrors up there? I didn't know. <laughs> what? Huh, mister? Well, 
So last week was a, a really, we had a hard day for mirrors at Besson Church last, last week. <laughs> last Sunday morning, Pete found the wall long mirror that was uh, in the men's room. He came in, it was on the floor, cracked into a thousand pieces. And, um, and I appreciate Pete. He swept that up all during worship practice. He's supposed to be back in the booth, but he's like, no, oh, you guys practice, I'll take care of it. And then after church, yours truly, uh, going back in here and stumbling around to, uh, to, to, fix, to fix things, um, shut things off. Yeah, I knocked it over and, and broke my own um, sermon display. Um, and some of you are superstitious. Ooh, bad luck. We don't believe in bad luck. We're not superstitious. A mirror broke, okay? Um, but here's, here's the thing. I was going to just toss it, and the Lord said, Are you kidding? That right there is, well, it's not going to work there. That is the perfect picture of, of people. That is, that's what Jesus, that's what Jesus came for right there. All of the, all of the broken pieces, all of the dislocated pieces of the universe, God puts back together beautifully. And he, he reflects our lives. Somehow, He takes our brokenness and He uses us for His glory. And so this morning, as, as we are closing out this message, I always like to end the message with, with bringing it to one focus. In other words, if... If you were to walk away from here and you didn't remember anything at all about the, the sermon, I hope you'll remember this one thing. I, even more than the picture of the fighting bunnies, I, <laughs> I hope you'll remember this one thing. And so when, when I am thinking about it and praying about it, I've used a lot of different vehicles. Sometimes I call it the takeaway. Sometimes I use different thematic ways of bringing it to focus. But all of, this, all of this campaign, what I've been doing is having you ask yourself, what's the big idea? In fact, I want you to ask your neighbor right now, what's the big idea? What is the big idea? The, the big idea is what I hope you will take with you. Don't be a cave dweller. Be a light lover. You were not meant to dwell in the deep, dark caves, right. in the mully grubs, beat down by all of the weight and pressure of life. But you were meant to live in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and to, to reflect, hey, you, we're all broken. But He's bringing all of these broken pieces together to make a beautiful mosaic and my, how the light is reflecting in so many different ways because of the broken pieces. There's actually a term for someone who loves the light. It's actually called photophile. Did you know that? If you love the light, you're a photophile. I don't really like that term because kind of, you know, it, a lot of, because of all the phobias, it sounds like other words and whatnot. But be a light lover. Just believe. Trust. Come into the light. Find your way out of the cave. Find your way out of the cave. Believing is looking into a mirror, seeing yourself in the light of Christ, realizing that you need a Savior, being, being a Christ follower is simply being drawn to the light. And so, if I, if I could reach down into the cave and crab you, 
and bring you up into the dazzling, brilliant light. If there's any way, because I, I've been in the cave, I know, I know how hard that is. But I would love to bring you to the opening and just grasp your hand and say, come, just come into the light. And so right now, as our worship team comes and, and we prepare to close out this service, I simply want to ask, if this message registers with you, and if in your heart you know that you need to be closer to God, then I'm asking you to pray this prayer with me right now. And as the, the house lights are going to come up around the room, I, I want to just give you a heads up and a little warning. I'm, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to pull you down to the front. I'm not going to, to ask you to, to come in that sense. And you have my honor on that. But I am going to ask, if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, at the end of this prayer, I'm going to say, hey, put your hand up. And that is your public expression that you are a follower of Jesus now. And so it's important because the Bible says we need to be able to testify about Jesus before men. Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me before men, my Father will be ashamed of you in heaven. So this is important that we acknowledge Him as our Lord and our Savior. Let's everyone bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, right now, in this space, I'm asking that a miracle would happen, that individuals would find something that they didn't expect to find, that the light of Christ will start to pierce into our hearts, and that You will lift us up out of the cave, lift us up out of darkness, lift us up into Your presence, Lord. Lord Jesus, thank You that You are our Savior. And you, you simply tell us that if we believe in You, if we confess You as Lord, if we forsake our sins, and if we determine to follow You, if we believe in our hearts, and if we confess with our mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, then we will be saved. And so, right now, I'm, I'm right there with you, brothers and sisters in this room. Some of you need to be saved. This is your day. Don't you miss this opportunity. Right now, in your own way, words like this, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. God, rescue me. Jesus, I acknowledge that You are who You said You would be. I believe that You're coming back soon. I do believe that You died on the cross. I believe You rose from the dead. I believe You ascended back to Your Father. And I believe that You are coming again soon. And I want to serve You. I want to live for You with all of my heart. So forgive me and receive me into Your kingdom. Right now in this moment, dear God, I feel you reaching down to me and lifting me out of the cave into dazzling, brilliant light of salvation. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like for everybody just to look up here. There's... This is such a safe place. There's, there's no fear in this place. I promise you that every individual in this room who follows Jesus, each one of us, we had our moment where we acknowledged Jesus as Lord. It's sort of exciting and scary all at the same time. But I promise you, it is the best decision that you will ever make in your life. And so, I'm asking, don't, don't just raise your hand unless you really mean it, but who are the ones 
Who are the ones today that say, yeah, I want that, of course. I just prayed that prayer, Keith, and I want to be saved. I want, I'm asking you, who are the ones who did that? Just slip your hand up this morning. I see you back there. God bless you. Who else? God bless you. I'm so proud of you. Are there others? You're right here. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Any others this morning? Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I want to ask our prayer team members to come. If you would, prayer team, just stand and fill in the area all across the front. And these team members are 